Thank you for listening to The Luminous Mind, episode 101. There are new opportunities that are opening up in ways that really were unimaginable a few decades ago. Also, bright opportunities to help our students learn more effectively and in ways that are more tailored to their abilities and interests. And so it's it's very promising time. Benjamin Franklin once said, Do not curse the darkness, rather light a candle instead. If you're ready to set your mind on fire, then prepare yourself for the Luminous Mind with your host, Rebecca Bowman. Today's fire starter is Heather Staker. Heather is the president of Ready to Blend, a research innovative focused on helping educators and families use blended learning to improve the achievement and well-being of K-12 through children. She's also the co-founder of Blended, using disruptive innovation to improve schools. She holds a BA, magna cum laude, in government from Harvard University and an MBA with distinction from the Harvard Business School. She's the mother of five children and she lives in Salt Lake City, Utah. Utah. Welcome, Heather. Hi, Rebecca. Thanks for having me. This is going to be fun. I'm a huge fan of your work, and so I'm excited to hear more about what you're doing. Do you want to just briefly tell us a little bit about yourself, and then we'll move on to your profession and what you're doing? Sure, absolutely. So after business school, I really wanted to use that background to improve the social sector. And I reached out to the Clayton Christensen Institute, which does really fascinating work looking at healthcare and education through the lens of innovation theory to understand how we can better breathe new life into those sectors of our society that have really been plagued with lots of problems for decades now. And I started working as a researcher for their education practice. And so for the past several years, I have been researching innovation in education. And I've really focused on blended learning, which is online learning uh, when students are, are attending physical schools, but but also having online lessons as part of their schooling experience. That is awesome. So the inspiration behind your organization is just trying to get those blended opportunities or what has your research been as far as that goes? And, you know, what modalities do you focus on? Sure. Well, so I started Ready to Blend just at the beginning of this year, in fact. Uh, in October of, of 2014, Michael Horn from the Christensen Institute and I published a book called Blended, Using Disruptive Innovation to Improve Schools. And that book was the culmination of several years of research looking at how schools are really using online learning to improve the schooling experience for students and to personalize the education experience for each student. And so with the arrival of that book, I found that there was a a broad appetite among um, teachers and school leaders and and parents to, to understand how digital opportunities are affecting the schools of the future and the schooling options that our children face right now. And so I decided to start this organization Uh, to serve that need and to be a play a small part in being a spokesperson for using the innovations that are now at our fingertips to improve the academic achievement and overall well-being of K-12 children. How did you get into that? I mean, as far as it something that you studied in college or was it just people that you met that kind of opened your eyes? Basically, tell us how your paradigm changed about how you can use technology in the classroom and with learning. Sure. Well, you know, it actually began when I was a senior in high school and the governor of California asked me to serve as the student member on the California State Board of Education. And I I grew up in Southern California, but for about one week each month, I would travel by myself up to Sacramento and live in the Hyatt Hotel across the street from the Capitol and serve on the State Board of Education with full voting rights. It was an unusual year for a 17-year-old. But that early exposure to the education system across the state gave me a a heart for the problems that are part of the system, the students that we visited, students that were in juvenile justice facilities, 
in foster care supervision, and, and then in, in all sorts of classrooms and circumstances across the state. And I really had my eyes open to the large, how big the system is and the complexity of the issues. And so marrying that with the perspective around innovation that I gained in business school and the thought that innovation is really a way to find new ideas that can improve standard of living. And that seemed to be an idea that was just ripe for education and that that our system would benefit from bringing the best ideas and the best new technologies and advances to helping us solve some of its more complex problems. Yeah, well, and you talked about the customization of education through technology. Do you work with different programs or with your ready to blend? Do you work mostly as a legislative type, just educating people or? Primarily what I do is I speak and I train. And so I'll go around the country and uh, speak with teachers and superintendents and school leaders about how online learning is changing the way that the world learns and then offer practical how-to steps for for how to really embrace the opportunity and at the same time how to mitigate the risks so that we only bring the best that this innovation has to offer to our students. That is great. So what would you change about your own education to make it more supportive to the mission that you're doing now? What a great question. I found particularly as a mother, you mentioned that I have these five children and and there are two things that help me be able to contribute to the community as I'm trying to do, to do with this organization at the same time as remain true to my belief that these children are among my most important of all obligations. And the two things are First, it, it really helps to have a deep specialty. And I felt like it took a long time for me to find that specialty, that I was really a generalist throughout college and even part of business school. And that specialization is tremendously powerful. And as I look back at my high school career, I, I, I went to a terrific high school, it was nationally ranked, and it was a great experience. But I do think that one thing that, that we're learning as we look at these new models of education is that it's easier to tailor content and instruction around the individual needs and abilities of each student. And that really wasn't possible in the past. When I was growing up, some students got to be in a gifted and talented program. Um, some students might have been designated as special needs or English language learners, but we weren't really able to recognize the fact that in truth, every student is gifted and talented in his or her own way. And that the ideal is to bring a customized learning experience to each student to help them optimize and maximize their gifts, as well as work around whatever their disabilities might be or the, the areas of learning that become harder to them. And I think that as we do that, we'll see students soar ahead and actually be able to hone in on their areas of specialization. And so I wish that looking back, I had had that opportunity to really move forward um, at my own pace and according to the pathway that was the best fit for my life's journey, because I think I could have honed that, that specialization more quickly um, and, and earlier in my life. That is true. So what challenges have you met with trying to get this message out and trying to, you know, create situations where schools have access to technology? I think there's two two things that that are hard for a lot of schools. The first is that it's a really different way of thinking about the teacher's role. And some teachers, in fact, look at technology and look at online learning specifically, and they say, am I being replaced? Now that there's not as much traditional um, chalkboard instruction, what's to become of me? And I've felt passionate about helping teachers realize that there is a bright and crucial opportunity ahead for them to deepen learning and to extend the learning and to mentor students and to counsel with them and all sorts of roles that are just so important in this century and that are now more available to teachers because they have online learning as a resource that they can deploy in their classrooms. So I think helping teachers understand that shift in their role has been critical. And then the second piece of it is that Oftentimes, it's hard for schools to adjust to the cultural change, that it's very different for students to be thinking in terms of their own schedules, their own learning pathways, having their own device that really is a, a portal to 
any number of virtual destinations. And so there are all sorts of tasks and routines that need to be put in place for that to work well so that students are using the digital platform appropriately so that they're not on things that they shouldn't be on so that they're making progress on their personalized learning plans and and all sorts of things need to work together to deliver a student experience that's superior to in a traditional environment. And so that takes a lot of thinking to help schools make that cultural shift. Well, yeah. So, I mean, if we start off with the the first challenge that we have with teachers, what do you tell them? I mean, as far as being a mentor, how can they better use this in their classroom? Um, Let's start off there and then move on to the second part of, you know, helping students, because I'm sure one of their big worries is that children are going to fall through the cracks. I mean, if we're doing everything online, how do we track those students? How do we make sure that they're actually doing their lecture? Because I mean, we're kind of talking about a flipped classroom where they're studying kind of on their own and they're not they're not sitting in a lecture hall listening to the teacher, right? Well, so there's a few different ways that blended learning appears, and it doesn't necessarily mean that they're doing everything online, but flipped classroom is certainly one of the models where students would be doing the lecture online, say the night before, and then coming to classroom for the application or the problem set or the lab or the discussion. And so that's certainly one example of blended learning. Sometimes it all takes place within the classroom itself, so there's not anything that happens at home. The, the online learning is within the classroom, so maybe they're rotating between stations. So they'll do an online station, and then they'll do a small group discussion station, and then maybe they'll do a, a group project station. So that rotation model is another classic example. A third common model is where students are taking a fully online course with an online teacher and then continuing to attend school. So suppose your school doesn't offer... Um, an AP physics course, then the student might elect to take an AP physics course online and then do the rest of her high schooling face to face. Um, and then another another classic example would be more of what we call a flex model, where the students are showing up for the course, but the course is mostly online in the classroom. And then the teacher's role has shifted to being someone who offers just in time support and enrichment activities, um, but they're no longer the primary deliverer of the content and the instruction. So there's different models for how um, it comes to be. And really depending on the model, the teacher's role varies. The most important thing for a teacher is to define the problem that they're trying to solve or the opportunity that they're hoping to pursue. Oftentimes teachers just start by saying, I want one-to-one classroom, meaning one computer for every student in my classroom. And that's where they begin is with the technology. And I think that's a big mistake. It's much better to start by saying, you know, I just don't have enough time for one-on-one tutoring or for small group instruction or to meet the needs of the 30% of the students in my classroom that are English language learners. And so they identify what the problem is, and then they're very laser focused about choosing a model of blended learning and devices and software that best address that specific problem and then measure to make sure that they're actually solving that problem as they go with it. Wow. So do you give them mentoring on which would work for their best application? Because I would imagine that would be somewhat challenging for them to kind of think about, you know, what are their problems and how to best solve it? Is that what I mean, you do with that one on one mentoring? So yes, yeah, so we've tried to really help offer some some guidance around around the models that work best in different circumstances. And in this book that came out in the fall called Blended, um, in chapter eight, we walk through the different considerations, and then what model might work best for for that classroom. So for example, if there are only, say, enough devices for a sixth of the students in the classroom, then a station rotation model could work the best, where students really are only on the device for a sixth of the time, and then they're rotating to five other stations for the rest of the time. Um, And then for other classrooms where they have other, where they have a device for each student, then they have other options, like say, doing a flipped classroom. Oh, wow. That's neat. So going to our, the second part of the challenge of how the students, you know, are organizing their time, do you find that that's somewhat challenging for students? I mean, especially if they've been in a, a lecture sort of education most of their time, do most kids have problems with that? And what limitations do they have with that because of technology? I think inviting students to own their own learning is both challenging and also super promising because it is an adjustment for students to stop 
thinking of schooling as being an opportunity for them to be spoon fed content yeah. as they sit back passively and absorb it or don't. And instead to know that they are the agents that are accountable for setting their learning goals and then going after the content that they need and then demonstrating mastery at the end of the week or at the end of the unit. And that's a huge mindset change for students. And so although it can be challenging, it's also one that I think a challenge that I think we want to take on and that it will be will redound to our benefit as we have millions of students develop the capacity for being owners and agents of their own learning and setting those goals, those skills will then benefit them for the rest of their lives. Yeah. I actually heard just recently, just a couple of weeks ago, somebody asked the question, are you a homesteader with education where, you know, you set the pace and decide where you're going to go and what you're going to build, or are you a squatter on your education? You know, where, yeah. like you said, that you just expect somebody to spoon feed you and you're just there, you know, kind of encroaching on their space, hoping that some of that's going to rub off on you. <laughs> anyway, so I that's thought that, great way of looking at yeah, it. yeah, that goes kind of with what you're saying. So, I mean, talking about that and what successes have you seen with children that are able to kind of use different blended learning models? Well, I can tell you from personal experience that as I started writing my first white paper, I suppose, on blended learning, we were living in Honolulu at the time. And one of the schools that I profiled was based in Austin, Texas. It's called Acton Academy. And it's a micro school that's actually starting to spring up in cities all over the world. And it's so thoughtful in the way that it combines online learning with rich face-to-face -face interactive project-based learning experiences that I turned to my husband at the end of interviewing this school leader and said, you know, if we don't actually move to Austin, Texas to go to this school, then I will start one myself. I'm so impressed <laughs> by the way that they're thinking about blended learning. And it turns out that we decided to move to Austin, Texas. And so we moved to Texas and enrolled our own children in this school. And so as a parent, I can tell you that it's hard to go back after you see your own children experiencing that kind of freedom to move at their own pace, that kind of competency around setting their learning goals and then learning to master them with a lot of self-initiative, those are freedoms and skills that you wouldn't want to reverse and so I didn't anticipate at the time how much I was making a long-term choice by wanting to attend that school, but it has been striking to see in our own children that they've been able to move forward in the areas that where they have a natural proclivity. And then in the areas that where they struggle, they've had so many options for how to fill those gaps and how to master the content and how to um, even slow down so that they really get it. And so that's what we mean about personalization. And you see it starting to create success for each student. And I really think it dissolves the idea that some students are gifted and talented and others aren't. That's just a false category in my mind, because we now see that there are really areas of excellence that can be cultivated in every student. And as the founders of Action Academy say, we believe that every student who wants our doors is a genius. Wow. It's just finding that genius. That's their challenge, right? So that's right. And then in the areas where, where there's signs of weakness, finding a way, a path, a customized path for that student to help them shore up their weakness, it can be done. And we're sophisticated about that in so many other sectors of our society. And it's high time we bring that type of savvy and innovation to our children. Yeah. Before we go on, let us take a minute and hear about our sponsors. Ready to homeschool your children, but you have no idea where to start or how to do it? Already homeschooling, but you're running into problems, or maybe you just want to improve results? Are you an expert homeschooling parent looking for every possible angle for your children? The Homeschooler's Handbook, written by an award-winning teacher with over 40 years experience at every level of education, has the tools and answers you're looking for. Use the link on the LuminousMind.net podcast show notes page and buy your own copy of the Homeschooler's Handbook today.
Welcome back to The Luminous Mind with Heather Staker. Well, so you have talked about, you know, the challenges that we face with educators and how they see technology. And then we've also talked about the students and, you know, getting them on this idea of like, yeah, you're the owner of your education. Let's talk about parents because, you know, a lot of parents are really worried about, you know, too much screen time or that their kids are sitting too much, that they see maybe online education really passive. What advice would you give to those parents about using blended technology? Well, I think that they should absolutely trust that instinct to distrust the technology. And what I mean by that is that for parents that are considering a blended program, observe the program and observe how much time is spent passively looking at PDFs online versus how much thought has been put into designing the right student experience. Now, it may be that in the case of an AP physics course that's entirely online, it will be an online experience. And even then, you can evaluate the online experience to make sure that it's rich, that it's not just reading lesson plans and PDFs that have been scanned onto the computer, but that there's actually some interaction and that when students aren't learning a concept, that there's adaptivity to help adjust the course to meet that student's individual needs. And really just to make sure that course is high content, high quality. But in the case of most blended programs where there's really a mix of face-to-face learning and online learning, it's important for parents to, to look at that blend and to make sure that, that there are appropriate times when the students sit in their computers and are, and are interacting with each other and having enjoying Socratic discussion and, and project-based learning and experiential learning and all of the things that will deepen and expand and bring relevance to the learning experience. I think it's also a mistake for parents to say, to look at screen time all as one category because screen time could be Phineas and Ferb on Netflix or it could be learning Korean on Rosetta Stone and there's really a big difference and so it's important for parents to help their children distinguish between the online junk foods and the online superfoods. Yeah. Well, and as a parent yourself, I mean, since we weren't raised in this way, I mean, what are some of the myths that you've had to kind of debunk in order to get people a lot more comfortable about online learning? Well, I think one thing is to recognize that when students are going online, they are going on a field trip. And it might be a virtual field trip, but it certainly is a a true destination. And so it's smart for parents to understand what the destination is, how success will be measured, whether they'll be safe as they're on that journey when they're coming home again. So that's an important thing, I think, on the cautionary note. But then in terms of the opportunity I think we can open our minds to how much rich content really is available online and that some of the geographic impediments that have kept us from experiencing the Smithsonian Museum or foreign languages or high quality teachers or whatever the things are that are shortages in your students' lives, there now are increasingly options online that are worth exploring. Yeah, exactly. I had one more question in regards to parents and I can't remember. Oh, about safety on education. I mean, that is another thing I think that parents are scared about. What is your recommendations on keeping your students safe online? Well, one is that I think it's important to teach children the right skills for if they encounter something that's inappropriate. And some students just don't even know what to do if something flashes up on their screen. And so teaching them some sort of a system like to crash the computer and then tell the teacher, crash and tell, crash and tell, and to practice that, or to close the laptop screen or whatever this, whatever the culture is going to be, but to practice that routine so that children are empowered with something, with a process to handle inappropriate content. And then I think also just to establish a tight culture around what the learning norms are and what the expectations are and when students are accountable to the teacher so that rather than the blended environment being one where teachers are constantly policing to make sure that students aren't doing video games, um, the students are aligned to the overall culture of the classroom and there are many check-in points and procedures to help students be successful. Yeah, I like the idea of the check-in and you know, you're know you always checking because if kids aren't being accountable for their education, do you find that they're getting in trouble online? 
there's really a broad mix. There are some implementations that are so careful about the culture and really thinking through how do we set up routines to help students be successful and to get on track. And then there are other schools that haven't been diligent about that and they find that their blended program actually has a messier culture than before they went blended and when they were just traditional because now students have all of these pathways for for getting off track and for exploring content that has nothing to do with what they're supposed to be learning. And so I think it's incumbent on schools to get really smart about and to really take the steps to identify what are the tasks that need to get done every day among our, our students and our teachers, and then how can we set up routines and rituals to help those students accomplish those tasks, and how do we celebrate success? And that's really how you set up a culture that's that's almost like autopilot, where the students and the teachers are working together to accomplish this overall objective. Yeah. Well, do you ever see, I mean, one of the things my kids do virtual learning, and I find my son like he'll get off track, but he'll get onto something that kind of interests him. And then Mm -hmm. I mean, I've had to almost like, it's been a huge paradigm shift for me to go, well, he's still learning, you know, even though it wasn't like, well, I wanted you to study this, why weren't you studying this when he found something that he was more interested in that was to do with that particular? Yes, yes. I, I mean, do you find that where I guess that's the challenge that I see is trying to get parents to understand too that learning can look different for a lot of different people. What's your thoughts on that? No, I think that's a good observation. My son does the same thing where he'll be working on Khan Academy for math. And then the next thing I know, he's jumped over to Khan Academy for computer coding because that's just really what he loves. And so I think you're right that one of the opportunities that we face as parents is to potentially be able to help satisfy our, our children's innate abilities and interests more appropriately because there are a lot of different pathways they can pursue now that and and we don't necessarily have to think as of them as all going down the same road but there are a lot of different ways that we can help each of the if if there are multiple children in the family just helping them each do it their own way exactly great so you talked about working with michael horn and also the christiansen's so what mentors have you found along the way that helped make a significant difference in your success? A few of my mentors were my school teachers growing up. I remember my middle school teacher named Debbie Ryder, who I just adored and who was such a an important friend and mentor to me. And the reason those relationships mean so much to me now is that I'm determined to, as I talk about blended learning, just emphasize that those face-to-face relationships with trusted adults are important and they're critical and we all know that and we know that teachers make such an important difference in the lives of their students helping to cultivate great teachers and helping to to train teachers around the new opportunities that are ahead in this century with digital learning um, is really important so that we don't lose any of the humanity in our schools and so that students continue to feel like they have those really wonderful adult mentors in their lives, even as they're doing some of their learning online. Well, and don't you feel like with online learning, though, it does increase a situation where the teacher can be one on one help to that student versus kind of like when we were growing up, when you had a class of, you know, 28 kids or something like that, and you're all trying to get them, you know, trying to get them to learn the same thing, there was less one on one time, don't you think? Or. Oh, that's exactly right. And I think that the best teachers are seizing that opportunity. And they're saying, look, if we have some of the students working with adaptive software that helps me understand where they are with the content, then that affords me an opportunity to be working one-on-one or in small groups. And that's a good trade. Well, and I think as a parent, too, you can tell the difference between a teacher that's just using the technology, you know, to keep your kids busy and those that are trying, like you said, trying to find that passion trying to help that child instill a passion for what they want to learn, right? I mean, that can also be a clue for parents. I think we've always had schools that where the teachers rely a lot on worksheets and there's not a lot of inspired teaching happening in that school. And now we're seeing the next generation of that with teachers that just basically use the software to babysit the students. And again, that's not an improvement for our students. And so parents can be on the lookout for the programs that really are imaginative about how to seize the adaptivity and personalization of online learning and then marry it to the opportunity for more individual 
mentoring and small group instruction and project-based learning that can be part of rich blended environments. That's great. So I kind of asked you how families, communities, and schools are benefiting from this educational philosophy, but do you want to talk a little bit more about that? I think there's three ways that they're benefiting. First, there's an opportunity to personalize around individual needs, which we've discussed. The second is that communities are finding that they no longer are as constrained by their geographic location. So even if you may be living in rural Texas, there's still an opportunity to take an advanced course from Harvard because those courses are now online through edX. And so those geographic boundaries are really being blown apart. And it's no longer as important to live in the right zip code, which is welcome relief for families that have for so long felt like they could only live in certain zip codes and the housing has to be a certain price or the schools aren't going to be good enough. I think we're going to see some relief there for families and it's only starting to emerge. But I do think that it will emerge as schools find that they can still offer great courses, even if they're in any number of circumstances. And then the third thing we're seeing is that it's easier to deal with budgets in this new world because blended learning oftentimes allows for a reallocation of dollars so that schools can say, you know what, we save some money by offering the Chinese course online when there were only three students who wanted to take it anyway. And because of that money, that that savings, we're going to pay all of our teachers 30% more. And what, or whatever the trade-offs are, schools are finding that they now have some control over their costs, which they didn't have before. That is great. That seems very exciting to me. So as a company and you yourself personally, what do you hope? I mean, what do you see in the future and what are some of your long term goals? One thing I'm excited about right now is that I'm actually blending my blended learning workshops. And so I'm helping teachers and administrators experience blended and personalized learning as they're learning about blended and personalized learning which makes a lot of sense when you think about it. Um, But I'm excited about professional development moving in the direction of more personalization so that teachers can earn micro-credentials for developing competencies around specific skills, and we can see a lot more specialization among the teaching force, and that the same principles that work for students around allowing them to personalize and allowing them to move forward as soon as they demonstrate mastery and as soon as they and and work at the right pace and those principles, they really can work for teachers too. And so over the term, I'm excited about even a sharper teaching force. Yeah. What do you think testing? Do you think testing will move that way too? Because right now we are seeing, it almost seems like, you know, as we move more individual and everything that's going on, it just seems like with testing, it's becoming like, well, they they need to be at this pace or that pace. Do you think testing will flex with the ability to individualize an education? One thing that we're seeing with blended learning is that it begs for a lot more formative assessment, which means assessment that happens every day to assess where the student is right now and then to inform instruction. And so instead of it being a high stakes test at the end of the year where some students pass and some students fail and so what, they move on. Instead, formative assessment says, let's see where they are every single day and then have them move on at the right time for them or adjust because it's not working. And so let's adjust now before they fail. And it's a really different way of thinking about assessment, but I think it's much better for the students. And so I I hope that that will be a big emphasis of schools moving forward is that micro assessment that will allow us to um, inform instruction. And I do hope that they use that. I mean, in the past, and even when I was growing up, you know, you, you came up with the final grade and that was what you got in that. And we never really did use the testing to really find out where a child struggled, you know, what they weren't learning, what they weren't grasping. And how demotivating is that, right? Exactly. That's worse than to get your grade and be told, sorry, there's nothing you can do about it. Yeah. And it just may be that you needed to hear the the content in a different way or something. So that seems so exciting to me. I agree. So do you have any, I mean, other than your own book, or you can even talk about that, do you have any resources that maybe parents or educators could you know, access to better educate themselves on what blended learning looks like or, you know, how to best utilize that for their child's education. I have a website called readytoblend.com. And on that, I highlight schools that are doing a good job with blended learning. And I just talk about blended learning. And in general, I spotlight innovations that I think are improving K-12. So I hope that'll be a helpful resource. And I really am excited about the dialogue that can happen on that website as, as parents engage with that and teachers as well. 
And then also this book is called Blended, Using Disruptive Innovation to Improve Schools. It's available on Amazon, and it provides just an overall look at how blended learning and how online learning is emerging across the country and helps anyone who's interested in education and K-12 education get a better sense for where we think the future of schools will be in the country. That's great. Thank you. So tell me, if you could leave a legacy, what do you hope it's going to be? Well, my first legacy is, of course, my children. I'm just really delighted by the opportunity to have these children, and I just love them, and and I really put them first. And so even in this career that I've built with Ready to Blend, I, I always make it subordinate to the needs of these five children that I hope will be tremendous contributors to society in their own right. And so that, of course, is, I have to mention, is the number one legacy that I hope to leave to the world is their contributions. But apart from that, I also feel a heart for the well-being of children in general. Um, I've just always felt like that's my calling is to try and improve the lot for children. And so I hope that by really focusing on education, I can contribute in some small way to that. That's great. So before we say goodbye, do you have any final parting words of advice or maybe more that you want to say on this topic to our listeners? And then please go ahead and give us your contact information so that our parents and students can get in touch with you. Well, Rebecca, it's just really impressive to me to see the work that you're doing to help expose parents and your listeners to all of these new ideas. And I do think it's a bright time to be involved in education and to have children in the system. There are new opportunities that are opening up in ways that really were unimaginable a few decades ago. It requires good stewardship because there are risks and dangers that come with these new technologies. They're very powerful. But there are also bright opportunities to help our students learn more effectively and in ways that are more tailored to their abilities and interests. And so it's it's very promising time and one that should be harnessed. The best way to reach me is just through the readytoblend.com website. There's an FAQ page with contact information. That's great. And I did fail to mention that Alan Staker, your <laughs> your husband, uh, he was on our podcast earlier talking about Brain Chase and how students used it during the summer. So I wanted to make that connection there so people knew how I, <laughs> how I heard about you. But I really appreciate you being on our show and definitely check your work out. So thank you so much. Thank you, Rebecca. It's a pleasure. Thank you for listening to The Luminous Mind. To learn more about Heather Staker and Ready to Blend, go to our show notes at theluminousmind.net. Be sure to become a subscriber to our free email list and consider joining our program by going to the scheduling tab to become a fire starter today. Help support the podcast by making all your Amazon purchases through the free Amazon widget on our website. Also, sign up to receive two free audiobooks from Audible at theluminousmind.net. Like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, Google+, and now Pinterest. Get our audio content by subscribing on YouTube, iTunes, and Stitcher. To help us grow, consider telling your friends about us. Leave us a review. Tell us how we can help you so together we can continue to light minds on fire and change the paradigm of education.